Welcome to our Sunday morning service, dear brothers and sisters. So glad that you can join us today. My name is Peter Tarantal, and I am standing in for the Reverend John Kominos, who is on a well-deserved break. Let's start our service by reading Psalm 13 and from the New Living Testament. How long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat, saying, We have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me.
Father God, we praise you, we worship you, we adore you. Thank you, Lord, for your presence with us today and every day. Thank you that we may come into your presence to worship you. We confess, Lord, that we have sinned. We doubt, Lord, when things are difficult, when natural disasters occur, when the world is uncertain. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us when we look toward the world and see darkness and become fearful of the future. Help us, Lord, to rest in you, to see you, to know that you hold us and that you hold every moment of the future here on earth and everlasting with you. Help us, Lord, to trust you with all of our beings. Thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers and that you grant forgiveness. Amen. First reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The second reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him going into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Kathy, for that wonderful Bible reading. I want to speak today on the topic coping with uncertainty and disappointment lessons learned from the post-resurrection and pre-ascension day period so it's those 40 days after Jesus's gener uh, resurrection to his ascension earlier this year I was in the US, I did some work with a local church there, and then I had the great privilege of seeing my uh, son, as well as my family, my in-laws, Kathy's family live in Nebraska. So it was a busy schedule, and then I went to um, Lincoln, uh, where I met up with Kathy's family. Two days before I was to leave, I went for my COVID test because you needed a, P a negative PCR to get back into the country. And to my horror, I was positive. You know, I had dodged COVID for two years, almost here in South Africa and I pick up COVID in the US. I had no symptoms. If I didn't need to go for a test in order to fly back, I would not even have gone. I was not so much concerned for my health or scared that I may, may die, but I was just with Kathy's 87 year old mother that day. I was traveling with my son in the car when I got the news that I was positive so my anxiety that I suddenly felt stemmed from the fact that I may have infected others. Now, praise God, none of them actually fell ill. Um, but I went through an anxious time and I am not an anxious person. I am generally an even tempered person. And I was wrestling with God through this. 
And then my dear wife, Kathy, gave me some great advice. And she asked me, Peter, what is God's invitation to you during this time of uncertainty and anxiety and fear? I will share more a bit later. Coming back to our passage of scripture and some of the lessons that we can learn, let's look at their possible state of mind. And firstly, I'm sure they felt fear because in John 20 verse 19, it says they locked themselves up for fear of the Jews. In fact, in another passage, it says that fear spread throughout that, uh, that area. And it was like, well, if you are aligned to this person, Jesus Christ, then you are in danger. That's why Peter even denied him, because he thought, well, if, if I am aligned to him, I may also face possible punishment and even death. So fear, and so many people are gripped with fear, right? Doubt. They were filled with doubt. Just think of Thomas in John 20 verse 24, when the other disciples told him, we had seen the Lord. What was his response? Well, unless I can put my finger in his side and I can see him with my own eyes, I will not believe. Disappointment. Luke chapter 24, verse 21, when these two men on the road to Emmaus, as they were talking about the things that they had witnessed and experienced, and Jesus drew close to them and said to them, hey, so what are you guys talking about? And then they were expressing their disappointment. Actually, we had hoped that he would be the one but alas, he is dead, and this is now the third day. I think it's safe to say they were disappointed. And so many people are struggling with disappointment even in these days. You know, when God doesn't seem to be answering our prayers, um, do we have a sense of disappointment? Um, one of my favorite writers, Chuck Swindle, wrote a book, uh, and I think the title goes something like this, Disappointed with God. But the, the next one is disillusionment. John 21 verse 13. Peter said, Amen. I gave up everything for three years and I'm not sure that this worked out. So I'm going fishing. The very thing that they had given up in order to follow Jesus he now said, I'm going, I'm going back. And guess what? The other disciples said, yeah, we are going with you. And I wonder if there was a sense of, was it worth it for them? Was it worth following Jesus? Was it worth leaving our families, forsaking all, etc.? I don't know how many of you have heard of the story of a lady called Helen Rosevier. She was a British uh, missionary who went with WEC to the Congo. Um, and she was there from 1953 to 1973. While she was there, um, the Congo had an uprising and there was a rebellion and it was a terrible civil war. The rebels were brutal. They killed so many thousands of innocent people. Helen Rosevier writes that one night they came in to the place where she was staying and they beat her up and they raped her twice. But she continued to stay on and serve the people. Some referred to her as the modern or or as the Mother Teresa of that time. And she's an older woman now. And she would share her testimony. She had gone back to the UK. And a few years ago, she was in Brussels 
sharing with a group of young people. And one young man stood up and he said to her, Miss Roosevelt, as she shared a story, can I ask you this? Was it worth it? Was it worth it? And she said, you know what? I asked the Lord the same question. Lord, was it worth it? And she said, his response to me as he spoke to me in my heart was, Helen, it's not, was it worth it? It's, am I worthy? And she said, I said, Lord, you are worthy. So they suffered with this illu disillusionment. And then a sense of loss. John 20 verse 2. Just think of Mary Magdalene as she went and she discovered Jesus wasn't there. She said, they have taken the Lord. He is gone. Friends, this, the past two years, so many of us have suffered loss in so many different areas, whether it's personal loss of family or friends, loss of a job, loss of relationships, but so many people have suffered loss. So those are just some examples of what their possible state of mind could have been like. How did Jesus respond to this? Well, firstly, he shows up, he appears to them. He firstly appears to Mary Magdalene, the most unlikely person, a prostitute, one who was ostracized by society. Jesus appears to Mary. Then he appears to the women. Now, this may seem implausible in the 21st century, but in the first century, the testimony of women were not given the same weight as that of men, either personally or even in a court of law. In fact, Luke chapter 24 verse 11 says that the, for the 11 disciples, when the women told them that we have seen the Lord, their word seemed like nonsense to them. Not very encouraging, is it? And then he appeared to the disciples on the mountain in Galilee, Matthew 28, verse 16. And then, of course, he appeared to Thomas and he said to him, Thomas, touch me. Of course, he also appeared to Peter. In John 21, as he had this conversation with Peter, Peter, do you love me? And then he appeared to more than 500, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. And he appeared to many others. The reason I mention this is because he showed them that he was alive, that he could walk he could eat. I am not dead. Jesus showed up for them. Brother and sister, I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know the difficulty that you may be going through, the anxiety, the un un uncertainty, the disappointment that you may be going through. My prayer is that God will show up for you. But secondly, he continued to work. He performed miracles like the miracle of the 153 fish when he told the disciples, throw, cast your net on the other side. And their catch was so big that they had to call others to come and help. God is at work. One of my favorite worship songs these days is Waymaker. And the refrain goes something like this. Even when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. He never stops. He's always working. God is working. Thirdly, 
He conversed with them. He had a conversation with them. And what did he talk to them about? Well, first about their issues. Firstly, he spoke to Thomas about his doubt. He was very specific about what he conversed with Thomas about. Thomas, I know what your problem is. You don't believe. And so Jesus engaged with him right there where he needed to be engaged. The two on the road to Emmaus, he conversed with them about their lack of clarity of what he taught them while he was with them. My friend, even if you just want to pause this or at the end of the service, talk to Jesus about your issue. One of my favorite old, times, old time hymns is, I must tell Jesus all of my trials. And then the refrain goes, only Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Tell Jesus what you are going through. And then he talked to them about the kingdom. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. You know, it's interesting. The kingdom was always a priority for Jesus. When he started his earthly ministry, he said, the kingdom of God is here. For him, he it was about the kingdom. And for us as followers of Jesus, we must live as people of the kingdom who live according to the principles of the kingdom. Let me say this very sensitively as a fellow struggler and brother in Christ. Kingdom principles should always trump my national, cultural or personal values any day of the week and maybe twice on Sundays. Let me give you an example. I worked with somebody some years ago and this person said he was from another country. He said, well, in my culture, um, I lead from an autocratic style of leadership. What I go, what I say goes because in my culture, Positional leadership is the greatest value. It's an honor-shame culture where no one dares to question you. And I said to this person, but just go and read again John 13, where Jesus says, He who wants to be the greatest among you must be the servant of all. So kingdom values should always trump my cultural value. In his book, um, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church, The Improbable Rise of Christianity in the Roman Empire, Alan Crider asserts that the church grew because ordinary people lived out kingdom values like loving one's neighbor caring for the poor, etc. And that's how the church grew. But then he gave them a charge, the Great Commission. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you and lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. We have the church today because some of the people who heard this obeyed. And may we as a church continue to obey the Great Commission to make sure that we reflect the glory of God among the nations. Fifthly, he encouraged them to wait for the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1 verses 4 and 5, Jesus said, You are not abandoned. In fact, I am with you. He said, wait for the coming 
of the Spirit. Because they may have felt abandoned, but he said, you are not abandoned. And I want to say to you, my friend, and I know so many people, especially during COVID, suffered from a profound sense of loneliness or being alone. You are not alone. He is there with you through his Holy Spirit. Someone once said, be okay with not knowing for sure what might come next, but know that whatever it is, you will be okay. So, as I conclude this time, what are the implications for us and what are some of our takeaways? Firstly, I want to suggest, acknowledge how you are feeling. You know, it really helped me, as I said right at the beginning, my own experience when I contracted COVID in the US to say, Lord, I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling anxious. And quite honestly, I feel a bit let down because I had worn my mask. I, did, I socially distanced. I tried not to hug anyone. Although those, although those Midwesterners are such warm people, everyone wants to hug you. Eventually, to be honest, I gave up. But I felt a, a little bit, I did my bit, and here I contracted this virus. So, acknowledge how you are feeling. And what helped me was I embraced the uncertainty. And that really was a great help for me. Some of the most beautiful chapters in our lives won't have a title until much later, said Rob Goff, the author of Love Does. Let me read that again. Some of the most beautiful chapters in our lives won't have a title until much later. And then, Receive today the Lord's word of peace in the midst of uncertainty, disappointment. Like Luke chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Receive that peace today. Jesus is uncomfortable. One of, you know, there are a few uncomfortable promises in the Bible, right? But one of his uncomfortable promises was, it was, in this world, you will have trouble. But then he goes on, however, take heart, I have overcome the, I have overcome. And then look for God's hand around you, even in your circumstances. Look for God's hand. The story of the town of Bucha, just outside Kiev in the Ukraine, gripped the world like few others. A few weeks ago, we all remember the atrocities committed by the Russian soldiers as they left Kiev and they left Bucha. They, it was just so terrible, where they tied up people, beat them up, left and just left them in the street for dead. You cannot believe the inhumanity. Several of them were shot in the head. Ivan Rusin, president of the Ukrainian Evangelical Theological Seminary, um, was coordinating relief efforts from a safe house in Kiev. And when he went to Bucha, he said it, he had not seen such wickedness before. And he said, I, I heard at least 15 stories of people who told me they buried their loved ones. Yesterday, we evacuated two ladies, one buried her husband in the yard, etc. There are thousands of people like this but especially old people who have nowhere to go. They told me about the hell they were going through. And then he said, I don't know how to explain it, 
But sometimes in God's silence, I hear his voice. I know this is a very contradictory statement, but in his absence, I actually feel his presence. And then he made this statement, and this is what I wanted to leave with you. I want to say I see God's hand at work. Here in the safe house, I can. But when I go back to Butcher tomorrow, can I say it to the old woman? Can I tell her that God is working in her life? Theologically, I believe it. But in such suffering, sometimes it's difficult to communicate it. But look for the hand of God. And then just lastly, listen for his message for you. What is God saying to you today? Some of the greatest works have come out of failure, distress and uncertainty. Let me close with a story. The founder of OM, George Verber, uh, was leading a team in the 60s in, uh, in the old Soviet Union. And, you know, it was forbidden to do any kind of evangelism. And they were then chased by the police and they made it across the uh, well before they got to the border. Uh, they thought no, no one will find us. But eventually they did this uh, secret police because they came across a, a peanut butter wrapper. And they said, you know, the only people who eat peanut butter, it's Americans. So eventually they found them kicked them out of the country and banned them for years and years from the Soviet Union. And there in a tree in Austria, as George was lamenting and weeping his failure for being so stupid to, be, to not be more careful, God gave him a, a word, the name for the organization now known as Operation Mobilization, it used to be send the light and OM was born out, was birthed out of failure. My friend, who knows what God can do with you? The Lord bless.
before you with so many things in our hearts, so many requests, so many issues. Thank you that you hear us. Thank you that you care about each detail of our lives. I pray for our congregation, for each person that is part of BBC in all of the life of the congregation. I pray, Lord, for our leadership and our minister, for wisdom in their work, I thank you for the work that they do, helping build your church with us. I pray for our country and its leaders. I pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and integrity in all they do. I pray, Lord, for an end to the corruption and selfishness of so many in leadership positions. You are almighty and powerful, Lord, to change the hearts of people to turn them toward you and toward the service of the people of our nation and not to their own selfish benefit. I pray especially for the people in Kuzuli Natal that have been ravaged by the floods. Please, Lord, fill their hearts with hope and comfort those that grieve. Thank you for all those that have been working tirelessly to assist in so many ways. I pray, Lord, for our world that is ravaged by war, Ukraine, Syria, Afghanistan, and so many other places that we are not even aware of. Father God, please bring peace to our world. Only you can do that. Make us each aware of your prompting, Father, to give assistance to others close by each day, or afar as you show us. Help us, Lord, to bring your light into this world. We want to hear you, Lord. We want to serve you by serving others. We ask your guidance in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. And as we conclude, May I pronounce the blessing over you and your loved ones today. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord bless. Mm -hmm.